In this video, we're going to explore a book that I thought was going to be a relatively simple reference, but has actually had a fairly profound impact on how I think and how I write. The book is How to Take Smart Notes. It's written by Sonke Ahrens, and its subtitle is One Simple Technique to Boost Writing, Learning, and Thinking for Students, Academics, and Nonfiction Book Writers. Welcome to Strategy Books. Introducing leaders to the books and ideas that make a difference, and most importantly, the books that can help you make a difference in the world around you. Hit the subscribe button to stay current, and that bell to be notified every time there's a new video up. I'm Mark Mullally, follow me here, and you can also connect on Twitter and Instagram at Strategy Books. And as always, the link to everything we discussed today can be found in the description below. So, let's get started. This is a book that, for me, I came to as I was working on the strategy making workshop uh, about a year and a bit ago. And I was looking for resources to be able to help think about how to be able to frame and how to be able to articulate personal strategy. I didn't go looking for this book. It found me. Uh, I, as I say, came across it as I was re researching the materials for strategy making. And it was one of those many suggestions from Amazon that helpfully come up saying, if you're interested in this book, here's other books that other people have found interesting as well, where I went, yes, clicked by and had it show up my doorstep a few days later. It's a different perspective though on personal strategy. And it's one we don't normally think about. And, and it's interesting from that perspective, because we think about personal strategy often it's about organization and planning and time management and organizing our to-dos. And we don't necessarily think about the mechanics of taking notes and how to be able to take notes and, and the specific techniques that we would employ to be able to do that. And that's what really resonated for me, because this is something that's really not necessarily taught. We make notes all of our lives. We did so in elementary school, we did so in university, uh, we do so in our professional careers. And I have been, you know, working as a consultant, I have maintained a journal and notebook for most of my professional career, but what goes into that varies. And often when you actually step back and look at how do people try to take notes, there's one of two spectrums. Either they try to capture absolutely everything or they capture almost nothing. And so something that promised smart notes seemed awfully appealing. So what was the author trying to do here? Uh, in terms of key themes, there were three. I'm going to start in a different place than you're probably expecting. Because the first theme was about exploring the writing process. And that goes back to the subtitle. It is a book for students for academics, and for nonfiction writers. And most people who write, interestingly, most authors are famous for this statement being true, absolutely hate the writing process. And what they really hate is blank page syndrome, confronting an open word processor with a cursor, taunting them at the top of the screen, and no words beyond that. And so there are, if you look at how to write and, and writing help resources and blogs and suggestions, in many cases the advice is start writing, get something down so that you can move from there. But the presumption is that we don't start writing until we actually sit in front of a word processor and we actually start committing to the final text. And that was fundamentally a perspective that Aaron's wanted to be able to argue and push back on. From, from his perspective, the writing process begins long before we actually even know that we're going to write something. And it starts with the note-taking process and being able to organize ideas in such a way that when we get to that point of writing, the writing itself will be easy and flow because we already know what we're going to need to say. And that is actually a really, really appealing premise to think about when we actually think about the process of producing a written work, whether that's a report, whether it's a deliverable, whether it is an article or a book, or just a presentation that we need to be able to put together for a client or for our boss. 
Now, the second theme also doesn't deal, doesn't deal with note taking per se, although it does so tangentially, because it basically deals with how we actually cognitively think about information. And to put not too fine a point on it, as human beings, we suck at memorizing. In short term memory, we can typically store three or four, no more than seven items. So when the grocery list of what we have to buy on the way home gets past three, you're in dangerous territory if you do not write it down. And our long term memory is relatively selectively and is still influenced by what is front and center today. And so you can learn how to do something You can learn, learn specific techniques, you can actually have a level of mastery of that for a period of time. <clears throat> and if you don't use it, if you don't keep doing that, come back several weeks or months from now, or even uh, a year from now, and you're going to have to completely reorient yourself to what was I doing and how did I do it? And where did I have to go? And what did I need to be able to do? And this is the thing we don't do well at memorizing what we do well at is recognizing patterns and connecting ideas. And so Aaron's argument around note taking is very much about using the brain for what it's good at and not using the brain for what it's bad at, which is where we finally get to advocating for and instructing in a very particular form of note taking, which is the other key theme of this book It's what the title promises. But to be able to get to that result, first, we need to be able to understand, well, what are we taking notes for? And what do those notes actually mean? And what do we want to be able to do with them? Now, to talk about anything with respect to this book, we need to talk about somebody apart from Sonke Aarons. We need to talk about Nicholas Luhmann, who is an incredibly popular person these days, very well talked about, not for the work that he did, but for the note-taking system that he developed. And he was a sociologist. He was a sociologist in Germany. Uh, he worked almost exclusively in German and is relatively well known in sociological circles, is particularly well known in German sociological circles, but isn't necessarily um, well cited or, or well referenced in that even native German speakers have problems with him and being able to interpret and understand the depth of what he wrote. His principal working period was 1966 to 1997. He passed away in, uh, I think it was 1998. And he, at the beginning of his academic career, so going back to the 1960s, set a research direction that basically promised a 30 year project of building a theory of society which if you're a sociologist is pretty much the holy grail. Like that is your giant magnum opus of work that he progressively worked through and delivered on pretty much on his promise schedule of 30 years. And the way that he did that, the basis for what was an incredibly prolific output for him was his system of note-taking. And it's specifically referred to by a German word, Zettelkasten, it's, it's a fairly common word in uh, personal productivity circles right now, specifically around his note-taking system. What it actually means in English is slip box. It is a card-based filing system. It is referencing the lowly note card, the three by five index card that all of us know and love from trying to actually give a presentation in grade school. And his claim of his work that as a writer and as a very prolific writer, he was never bored. And he was never blocked when something wasn't coming, when, when he wasn't engaged with or feeling what he was writing, he simply moved his attention to something else. And his slip box was a never ending source of inspiration and ideas for him in terms of being able to do that. And so he referred to it as his second brain. He referred to it as his collaborator in the writing process, because when he was stuck, he would simply dive into his slip box or his Zettelkasten and work to be able to then build, well, where do I go from here? And this is what Aaron's book is really about is explaining Zettelkasten to the slip box system as a very particular style of note taking that in his argument you should employ. Now, some of the basic features of the system, there are three types of notes first off. 
The first type is what's referred to as a permanent note. And this is the basis of what most people refer to and reference and recognize as the slip box system. By the time of his death, he, death, he had a um, library of 60,000 index cards organized within his slip box that was the basis of Lumen's entire work. And those were developed through the other two types of notes transitory notes and literature notes. So in terms of literature notes, in reading something, in coming to terms with a book or an article or a reference that you're resourcing, the idea of the literature note is that you're actually just capturing and making sense of what that particular piece of work is about. What does it mean? And particularly, what does it mean to you? And so the literature note really sort of is the summary and identification of here are the key things that I got out of this. It might include quotations, it might include ideas, it might include the basic overall structure of that content, but it's, it's a simplistic summary form of whatever the thing was that you had read that you can go back to as needed to be able to refresh your memory of what it was without having to go back to completely rereading the first the primary resource in the first place and that on its own is incredibly useful and valuable uh, the number of times that i have read or reread articles journal articles uh papers books because an idea was relevant in one project and then in doing a different project i remembered and connected back with that idea and wanted to reorient and refresh myself and had to go all the way back to referencing and scanning or fully reading whatever that primary reference was. I've, I've spent hours and days and weeks and probably months of my life just refreshing myself on things that I've already read. Whereas if I had taken good notes to begin with, I might have sufficiently been able to just go back to those basic notes about that literature and get what I needed out of it. But this is where we connect with permanent notes, because having summarized the work, we then explore the meaning of the work. We build our notes for us. And so the permanent notes are not summary reflection of what was read, it's reaction to what was read. That could have been inspired by, it could have been contrary to, it could be additive and building on, it could be saying, this is a good foundation, but it's missing this and this and this, and these are fields to be able to pursue. But it's basically taking the, the material that we've consumed and reacting and responding to it and making it ours. And then incorporating that knowledge and incorporating um, that detail into our own personal reference system. The basics of the Zettelkasten is every idea has its own card. And what's profound and different about it is that it is a bottom-up approach to organizing. So cards relate to those cards around them. He had a very specific numbering system that was really the, the essence of how the system worked that would identify where additional subtopics or branches of thought around that occurred. And so it wasn't organized as we would think about a card catalog system in a library as alphabetically or by topic. It was basically as ideas came, they were filed and they were filed rel relative to similar ideas already existing elsewhere within the overall system. Connections would then link cards together. So I might have a card here that was related to the topic it lives in but that connects to an idea over here. And so there would be a link on that card and possibly backwards from the second card to the first again to be able to navigate through the overall system. And then topics would provide a way to be able to dive in. If, you're, if there are, you know, in, in my work, for example, I probably have 10 or 11 key research topics. And so I might have an index of, and this particular topic begins at this card in this drawer, if I actually had a physical system, and this topic is here, and this topic is here. And so what Aaron's is trying to do is explain how to actually be able to use Lumen's Zellicasten system for your own personal note taking. Now, let's talk about gaps and concerns there. It presents as a general text about taking notes and about how to take smart notes. What it's actually advocating for is a very particular style of note taking. And arguably what it's, what it's advocating for is replicating that style wholesale in terms of your own personal note taking system. 
So what did I get out of it? Let's talk about how it was both relevant and not relevant to me. I found it at a very unique point in time. I started reading it when I was building strategy making, which was, again, a workshop focused on personal strategy. But it was also at a time when I was struggling with my own systems, with my notes, with my means of organizing, with my means of managing files and references and resource materials and being able to make sense around that. And at this point in my life and my career, I have accumulated significant files, gigabytes of data on a variety of different topics that are stored in a variety of different forms and places and contents, whether that's Dropbox, whether that is in a different file service, whether that is locally on my hard drive, whether it is backed up to a service, across all of my media, all the various different references exist, but there's no connection, there's no reference, there's no index, there's no real understanding of what's there, which means there are any number of resources that I found over the course of the years that might have been useful and built in a project, might have been found while I was doing a project that I thought was going to be useful at a future date and put aside to read and may not have even looked at or found again, or may have been something that was proffered and offered to me or sent to me that I, again, set aside and filed and haven't actually done anything with since then. And so for everything that I know is there, there's probably three or four or five times as much. I have no idea that could be useful, could be relevant, could be valuable, and, and yet I don't know. And so I was needing to rethink how to organize, not just a tweak, but, but really thinking about on a fundamentally different level, how do I make sense of material and how do I make sense of ideas and how do I make sense of my reference material relative to my ideas? And I was at a sufficient lull between projects where I actually had the bandwidth to be able to do that. And so here's the thing, this was a great book at a great time that was very useful in illustrating an example. And for a self-published book, it is incredibly well put together. It is well written, it is well edited, it is logical, it is coherent in terms of its structure. It progressively builds on the arguments it's making. Those arguments are well supported, they're well referenced, they're well cited. It makes a really good case for note-taking in the style of Nicholas Luhmann. That said, while it's advocating for a particular approach, it's not a reference book. It's advocating for a perspective or a point of view. It's building an argument. And the value here is that the argument is a good one. There's a lot of value that's presented, but it doesn't necessarily give you the specifics of how to. And so what are the takeaways that it actually does provide then? What did the author accomplish? For anyone that actually writes for a living, which is many of us, it provides a useful framework to think about how we organize and how we take notes. Aaron's is trying to promote and advocate for it, do it this specific way. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. But what the book does, regardless of that overall intent, is make a good argument where we have an appreciation of what our cognitive limitations are. We are able to challenge our notions about how we think and how we work, and we're able to then argue for a particular perspective about how to actually do this. And so as an example, Lumen's approach that Aaron's argues for is really impressive. The techniques are useful. They clearly worked for him. And most importantly, and this is the thing to keep in mind though, they were designed by and for him. They were about how he worked, they were about how he thought, and they were about how he organized. And so this is where I get to my problem with Aaron's book. He's advocating for doing it exactly this way, and yet that's not to say that this approach is actually going to work for everyone. And as an example, in my work as a consultant, I'm just, I'm not just a researcher writing about a particular field. I actually work, the work that I do operates on multiple different levels. And I, I wrote an article about this on my, my blog, but it's relevant to thinking about is what's contained here actually meaningful and actually useful. 
because for me, there are actually three core, three core domains that I draw on. First off, I am a consultant. And so I need to learn a lot and think a lot about how to be that in terms of managing a business, in terms of doing marketing, in terms of using technology, in terms of how to be able to facilitate effectively. All of the different skills and capabilities and talents and tools that I draw on every day in order to be able to do my work. And then there's the work of doing my consultants, consulting. So this is the subjects that I consult in, particularly in terms of strategy, and in terms of project management. And this is where we get into subject domains that would have been analogous to what Lumen was doing in terms of his work as a sociologist. It's about the subject of the writing that he's doing. And so there are huge literatures around strategy and around project management that I read and research and think in on a re regular basis, but that's the second domain. And then there's the third domain is the content of the work that I do. That isn't about my content, it's about my client's content. It's the industry that they're in, it's the problem that they're trying to solve. And because every project is unique and different, there are different materials and references and research that I need to do to be able to help them to solve the problem based on where they are. And so each of these three domain, domains is operative for me in most of the projects that I take on. And so when I look at Lumen's note-taking systems, it's like, well, I understand how that works from a subject perspective. So one domain is sort of covered, but it doesn't necessarily cover what I need to do in terms of the other two. And that's the thing. While the book is solid, and while it's practical, and while it is relevant, the presumption is you should want to actually adopt Lumen's approach wholesale. And some might. But many try and struggle. And if you just search for Zettelkasten on the web, type Zettelkasten into a Google search, you will find re many references and, and blog posts and <coughs> articles and queries about just that challenge. Worse, many more try to adopt the surface structure and techniques that are being argued here without really understanding the the meaning or the core principles that are actually underneath them and why they were developed and why they worked for Lumen and why something else might actually be, be appropriate for others, why something else might be appropriate for you. <clears throat> that's, now that's not to say there's not a lot of appeal here because all of it is tied to pursuing your particular research interests. And so what I want to do is actually explore and dive in and share with you part of the book, Getting Things Done by Following Your Interests. It's not surprising that motivation is shown to be one of the most important indicators for successful students, next to the feeling of being in control of one's own learning course. When even highly intelligent students fail in their studies, it's most often because they cease to see the meaning in what they were supposed to learn are unable to make a connection to their personal goals or lack the ability to control their own studies autonomously and on their own terms. These findings are an important argument for academic freedom. Nothing motivates us more than seeing a project we can identify with moving forward, and nothing is more demotivating than being stuck with a project that doesn't seem to be worth doing. The risk of losing interest in what we do is high when we decide up front on a long-term project without much clue about what to expect. We can mitigate this risk considerably by applying a flexible organizational scheme that allows us to change course whenever necessary. We accompany every step of our work with the question, what is interesting about this? And everything we read with the question, what is so relevant about this it is worth? Noting down, we do not just choose information according to our interest. By elaborating on what we encounter, we're also discovering aspects we didn't know anything about before, and therefore develop our interests along the way. It would be quite sad if we did not change our interests during research. The ability to change the direction of our work opportunistically is a form of control that is completely different from the attempt to control the circumstances by clinging to a plan. The beginning of the research project led to the discovery of DNA structure, was the application for a grant. 
The grant was not to discover DNA structure, but to find a treatment for cancer. If the scientists had stuck to their promises, not only would they probably not have found a cure for cancer, but they definitely would not have discovered the structure of DNA. Most likely, they would have lost interest in their work. Luckily, they did not stick to their plan, but followed their intuition and interest and took the most promising path to insight whenever one opened up. The actual research program developed along the way, and one could say they finished the plan on what to do the very moment they finished the whole project. There's a lot to like about that, and, and really what it's, it's talking about is that level of self-directedness, that interest in what you care about, what you value, what you are interested in, and having the freedom to be able to follow your nose and to be able to shift and to be able to make changes. And my, my challenge with that in terms of the, the intellectual freedom to do that is the relatively dogmatic focus on, and this is the specific way to take notes. Because what's still needed here is guidance, and that's not about a practical how-to. It is, in the book, an incredibly solid introduction to one person's how. But that's not to say it's going to work for you, and there's a great deal of thinking and experimentation and adaptation that's needed to be able to find an approach to, that works for you. So all that said, should you read it? This is absolutely a book that I recommend. Even if you are not trying to fix your systems on how you take notes, it's a good book. And it builds up its ideas and arguments well, and the underlying research that's done is exceptional. It does a really good job of being able to make that research acceptable, uh, accessible. So if, if you're interested in how we think and how we write and how we organize and how we structure, putting aside the note-taking system, there's still a lot of value here. For anyone that does write, it also speaks to our world. It prompts that writing should be interesting and enjoyable, not that it should be a chore. But there's a lot of essential insight into the writing process and the way that we struggle with it that's really, really valuable and relevant. And what it offers there is a reframing of what writing is and what it can be. And the value of being able to pursue one's own interests and follow what's actually appealing to you. It also offers a reframing of what it actually means to take notes around that and provide an opportunity to be able to really sort of build a meaningful dialogue around what you're exploring and what you're thinking about and what you're working towards and what you're trying to do and have a meaningful dialogue with your own thoughts through the medium of note taking. So what it does do is it illustrates what's possible. Certainly it offers a practical approach to be able to address that, but that's not really the underlying intent. It's a structure to be able to work within, but rather than planning a process to impose on ourselves, being able to connect new ideas and prior knowledge and explore meaningful connections and insights where you actually get to make them your own. So if you do read this, what should you look for? Uh, the inherent value from my perspective is understanding how we develop creative and particularly analytical works. It's, it's about appreciating the process of writing and rethinking where writing starts, where writing stops, and what happens in order to be able to do that well. And so it, it starts with hearing the narrative message. Aaron's has a story to tell, and he actually tells it well. So just follow the story, let it help build understanding, and assess what it might actually mean for you. If that appeals, then it's worth going back in for a deeper dive and thinking about, well, how might I actually apply these ideas and apply these techniques and be able to make them work for me? So then you want to be able to think about being able to mine those for meaning and insight into techniques that you find relevant for you and to test what's relevant for you. Consider what doesn't resonate as well, and, and more particularly because it's unfamiliar, because it requires work, or because it genuinely doesn't work in your context. A lot of what Aaron's talks about as specific techniques 
while I may not want to adopt them wholesale in terms of what I do around note taking, I understand the principle behind why it's being advocated for or how it worked for Lumen. And there are a couple of key ideas in terms of bottom up principle to note taking, being able to structure and organize your notes and being able to make connections across notes that are incredibly important to solve if an approach like that is going to work. Lumen had one set of mechanics that were built around being able to manage that in what was literally a paper-based system. There are software systems now that are sold specifically to try to replicate the Zettelkasten system online. Some of them are more faithful than others, and that actually can be a barrier as much as it can be an aid, because to the extent that you need to modify or adapt what you need to do, that may or may not work for you. And this is where it always needs to start. What makes sense for you about how you need to think, about how you need to organize, about how you need to be able to structure, and then what note-taking, what file storage, what management approach around that actually makes sense. This is a book that's a really great introduction and exploration of a technique that has a lot to offer and a lot of promise, but probably still a need to adapt and think about differently if you're going to make it work for you. And it certainly did if I was going to be able to make it work for me. But it was a book that I valued reading, and it's a book that I would certainly recommend to anybody else that is trying to think about and organize and be able to structure and manage their work in a different way and find a way to be able to do that that's still meaningful. Thanks for joining us on Strategy Books. We'll be another. We'll be back with another episode soon. If you're interested in the books we talked about today, you can find links to them in the description below. Be sure to subscribe. And if you enjoyed today's recording, please hit that like button as well. Help others to be able to find the recording. Let me know what you got out of the book in the comments below and comment as well if you have any questions or ideas for a future book. That's our episode for this week and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks.